You know when you get almost all the way through recording a video and then you realize you haven't pressed record on the sound recorder over there? That's annoying. Hello and welcome back to another 5 Minute Friday here on... Hello and welcome back to another 5 Minute Friday here on Meaningful Money. Sorry it's been a few weeks since the last one of these, but you know, what can I say? It's really hard work and time consuming being a published author. <laughs> A little bit over the top, but this is exciting. If you haven't picked up a copy of the Meaningful Money Handbook yet, go to peatsbook.com for all the links as to how to do that. Amazon, obviously, is usually the first choice for most people, but you can get it at Waterstones, WH Smiths, or direct from the publisher. All those links are at peatsbook.com. If you've got it, read it, and enjoyed it, please leave me a review on Amazon. It massively helps. Enough of that shameless plugging. Let's get straight into the content here. And this is a question that I get, not from one specific person, but from lots of people all the time. Very common question, and it's about owning property inside a pension. So let's stick five minutes on the clock down here, say a quick thank you to my friends at Seven Investment Management for sponsoring the show down here, and let's crack on. Okay, first thing to say is that you can hold commercial property inside a pension, but not residential property. So no, you can't own a chip shop, which is commercial, with a flat above it, because that's residential. Anything where people might live, you cannot own inside a pension. But commercial property includes things like car parks and shopping centers, if you've got a big enough pension to own one of those, but more usually uh, industrial units, maybe on an industrial estate somewhere. Now, you cannot hold stuff like that inside a bog standard pension, like a stakeholder pension or a pension provided by an insurance company. To own commercial property, you need a SIP, self-invested personal pension, or a SAS, small self-administered scheme. I'm gonna park SASs to one side. They're pretty complex occupational type pensions, not really uh, relevant to most people. But a SIP, these days SIPs are everywhere, certainly much more common than they used to be. But not all SIPs are created equal. Very often you'll find something labeled as a SIP, and it is because it allows you to hold direct shares as opposed to just funds, but doesn't have all the full functionality that you need to buy a property. Sounded very Yorkshire then, functionality. So you need a proper full featured SIP to buy a property. And obviously there's costs involved with that. Putting a property inside a pension uh, is a conveyance, so there's legal costs involved. The pension company themselves wanna make sure everything's legit and sort of per the rules. And there's always extra costs involved with that as well. So make sure you know what you're getting into and make sure you can afford those costs, obviously. Now you can borrow to buy property inside a pension. You can borrow up to 50% of the value of your pension. So if you've got £200,000 in your SIP, you can borrow another £100,000 and use the full three hundred grand to buy a property somewhere. What happens then, of course, is that the pension is now the landlord. So rent goes into the pension. It doesn't go into your pocket as the pension holder. It goes into the pension bank account. Mortgage payments go out of the pension bank account. And your pension company, your SIP provider, will keep on top of all that for you. One thing to be aware of is that if the only thing you hold inside your pension is a property, that's going to leave you fairly inflexible when it comes to taking benefits out one day. So for instance, whereas normally you might take 25% of your pension fund as a tax-free cash lump sum, well, you can't sell one quarter of your property to enable that to happen. So it's always a good idea to keep some cash inside your pension or easily realizable investments like stocks and shares and stuff like that so that you can take flexible benefits one day. But, you know, that might be sooner or later of a concern for you. Just something to think about. So commercial property inside a pension, great idea. Don't see any reason why you wouldn't want to do it. Just go into it with your eyes open. But I have an alternative where you can get some of the benefits of property ownership inside your pension without the extra cost and hassle of actually owning physical tangible property. And you do that using pension funds. So this is just like ordinary funds where a fund will hold a bunch of stocks and shares, but these are funds which actually hold physical properties and they come in two flavors. First are called PAIFs, yeah. Property Authorized Investment Funds, PAIFs, and they are like ordinary OICs, ordinary funds that you get on any platform in any pension pretty much anywhere in the world, I imagine. Certainly this country anyway. So most of us understand how funds work. They are open-ended, which means if you wanna buy into a fund, the fund just creates more units and that's fine. It's easy for you to buy in. If you wanna sell out, it's usually very liquid. Careful with property funds though, sometimes they have the ability to put a moratorium, that is a stop on people selling units out because remember these funds hold physical properties and sometimes they can be difficult to sell so you may have a delay getting your money out but other than that PAIFs behave pretty much like any ordinary OIC uh, one advantage though is that any income received into the fund 
for which read rent, obviously, because the fund holds property, for certain eligible investors, that income is tax-free, which is perfect if you're holding that fund inside an ISA or a SIP where the benefits are tax-free anyway. The second kind of property fund is called a REIT, or R-E-I-T, Real Estate Investment Trust. And again, this is pretty much like any other investment trust. So it's a different kind of fund, closed-ended this time. Maybe I should do a video on the difference between closed-ended and open-ended funds. Hmm. Watch this space for that. But closed-ended simply means that there are a finite number of shares in that fund available. And if you wanna buy some shares, you have gotta find somebody who is prepared to sell you some. They don't just create them and destroy them as demand dictates. Investment trusts are different in a couple of other ways. Firstly, investment trusts themselves can borrow to buy property and to invest. That's called gearing, and that introduces an extra level of risk. Also can introduce an extra level of return, mind. So as ever, the link between risk and return holds true. Also, when it comes to investment trusts, obviously the underlying assets, the property in this case, owned by the, the fund has a value but also the market overlays its sentiment on top of that. So the fund might be valued either higher than what it actually holds because the market thinks everything's going well, or it might be valued lower because the market thinks that maybe this fund is in trouble or it's got some problems or whatever. And so you've got an added layer of price movement, not just the underlying assets and what they're worth, but what the market thinks, either trading at a discount where the market thinks it's worth less than it actually is, or at a premium where the market thinks it's worth more than it actually is. REITs have a special little rule which says that 90% of all the income received by the fund must be distributed, actually paid out to the fund holders. So that's advantageous as well if you're looking to secure a good level of income. As with all this stuff, do your research, understand the difference between PAFs, REITs, and actually holding physical commercial property. Go in with your eyes wide open, do your research, understand the costs and the risks involved. Last little thought, if you're gonna invest in funds, I think PAFs generally are easy to understand for ordinary mortals, a little bit less risky as well, arguably because of the fact that they can't borrow like REITs can. And I think that's it. So thank you for watching this Five Minute Friday. More next week, tune in then.